A vampire seductress who had torrid lesbian affairs with young women while draining them of their blood deep in the Carpathian Mountains. Tonight, we are talking about the Countess Carmilla Karnstein on Vampires Before Dracula. This particular series, which I am calling Vampires Before Dracula, goes into all of the various vampires from literature and mythology that come before the publication of Dracula in the late 1800s. So we're going to learn about various characters who not only influenced but led up to the most famous vampire of all time, all of whom are in the public domain and are available for your vampire project. So let's get started with perhaps the most famous of all of them, and that is Carmilla. Carmilla comes from a novella published in 1872 by Irish author Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. In this story, we are tracking a character named Laura, who is a young girl who lives in Austria, in the Carpathian Mountains, uh, in a county called Styria. And this takes place right around in the 1700s, and Laura's father uh, owns a small castle, or schloss, as uh, she puts it in the beginning of the book, and it's basically just the two of them. I mean, of course, they are, you know, sort of wealthy and have servants and all that sort of thing, but Laura is lonely, and her mother has been dead since she was a little girl. And in the story, there is a, uh, an incident where another young woman named Carmilla is dropped off uh, by her mother. And Carmilla's mother tells Laura's father, I have pressing business that I have to get to immediately and I have to keep on writing, but my daughter Carmilla is feeling ill, can she stay with you until I can come back and get her? And Laura's father, who has been worried about his daughter's loneliness, is like, of course, Carmilla seems to be around the same age. We would be happy for her to stay with us. Little do they know, as I'm sure you're able to deduce, that Carmilla is actually a vampire. And this is how she goes about hunting her prey. She uh, gets into a family's house where there is a young woman who then she uh, falls deeply in love with, uh, has an illicit lesbian affair with under cover of darkness, and then drinks the girl's blood. As Laura gets sicker and sicker, her father uh, discovers what's actually happening and calls upon a group of vampire hunters to come and help him save his daughter before it's too late. These hunters all have uh, some sort of history with Carmilla, uh, one of whom, General Spielsdorf, uh, his own daughter was killed by Carmilla in almost exactly the same fashion that Laura is dying from. And so the hunters all together go to the ancient ruined castle of the Karnstein family to hunt down Carmilla and try to destroy her on her own turf. I won't tell you how the story ends. And even the description I just gave you is the barest bones of the story. Uh, it's actually quite well written and it's not a very long read. Uh, so I recommend that you read it for yourself. And there's all sorts of good little nuggets in there from other little characters that show up, uh, little bits of vampire lore that are discovered along the way. Uh, that just add for some very interesting characters and is really good for sparking ideas. If, for whatever reason, you don't have the bandwidth to read it, you can always check out Maven of the Eventide's video on Carmilla, where she reads the entire story to you. And uh, that's a great way to experience it, because, of course, you get not only her reading it to you, but also all of her... Um, history f from having studied the book as well as her literary commentary which is always very insightful and very valuable and usually very funny too so uh, so definitely check that out 
if, uh, if reading off of a page is something that you don't have time for. But if you do have time, you can find Carmilla in lots of different places. Uh, there, it's, as I've said, it's in the public domain, so you can download it for free to an ebook reader, or it is usually part of just about any vampire anthology book out there, many of which you can purchase currently at your favorite bookstore or online retailer. But let's actually talk about Carmilla as a character and especially within the confines of her story, because she is really one of the prototypes by which so many of our vampires that we're accustomed to reading and experiencing today originally comes from. This was a book that inspired many different authors, including Anne Rice, uh, but as well as Bram Stoker. And there are some very good reasons for that. So let's, let's take a look at what Carmilla adds and brought to the genre. To me, Carmilla is interesting because she's an early case of a vampire who has a pattern. She prefers young girls, she has sex with them, and she drinks their blood. And because this is her specific predilection, she has a strategy for hunting her victims that has developed and been perfected over time. So that when we watch her execute this plan in the book, this is something that is probably not even the 30th time that she's done this and has clearly gotten it down to a well-rehearsed performance. It's a plan that specifically gets her seamlessly into the house of her prey where she can feed off of them over time in a way to where she won't be suspected. And to this point, she is even recruited, though we never find out how exactly, but she's recruited a group of humans to help her out with this strategy. And we don't know why they're tied to her. We don't know if they are tied to her willingly. We don't know if they are undead themselves. We don't know, we don't know anything about them other than this seems to be her crew for murder. And it's interesting because if you look at all of the vampire, the literary vampires of the 1800s, including Dracula himself, these are all geniuses. They're all very brilliant killers, but they're killers who, uh, who don't have a shtick. They happen upon their prey, or their, their killings are, um, are murders of opportunity. Whereas Carmilla has developed a plan that she has workshopped over time that allows her to get the exact prey that she wants over and over and over again. One could say that out of all of her contemporaries, she's the one who is an actual patterned serial killer with premeditation in her blood drinking. And... Obviously, Carmilla's taste in victim is the same as all the other vampires of the 1800s. She's after beautiful young women in the prime of their lives. And, uh, you know, this is most likely due to the fact that these were all men who were writing these stories. And even though Carmilla is a female character, you know, she's she's being written by a dude and the lesbian affairs are written to essentially get excited the male viewership of of the books however in there there is something to grab onto because carmilla is not just feeding for nourishment the way several of her colleagues are she is actually a serial monogamist. Part of her psychosis is that when she finds that prey, she falls in love with them and becomes extremely possessive of them on an emotional and attention-based level. 
while at the same time draining them of their blood. And eventually she kills the girl, and only at that point is she able to move on and go fall in love again. It is obviously evil, but it's also sad at the same time. And gives you a, a certain amount of pity and perhaps pathos for Carmilla. But what can we say about Carmilla as an actual vampire? Well, quite a bit, uh, because unlike her predecessors of Lord Ruthven and Sir Francis Varney, Carmilla actually has some pretty serious magical powers. She's able to change shape. Uh, she doesn't do bats or wolves, but she does do an enormous cat and can use that form to escape from uh, her lover's room if, if they're suddenly discovered, or she can use that form to actually drink their blood as well. Uh, Carmilla can also become incorporeal. Uh, she can't enter a residence without being invited, and that's part of her whole uh, performance that she's put together, is it specifically to be invited into the house where her prey lives. Carmilla does have to return to her tomb on a regular basis, which she's able to enter by magical means. That might sound familiar. She can go out in daylight, but she doesn't like it. It makes her uncomfortable, and she seems to weaken when it happens. Also, she does not like the sound of prayers or any sort of holy gatherings. And a stake through the heart will most definitely kill her. Now, there are also some very interesting, more complex elements uh, that are in Carmilla. One of which is that, like Dracula, she's very clever about hiding her burial place. And I won't go into exactly how, it's just better if you read it. But that is something that one would expect from a smart vampire, is that they would make it very difficult for hunters to come and find them and kill them while they're sleeping. Lefano also adds uh, a very interesting little bit of mythology here uh, to the vampire in that in this story, uh, Carmilla goes by many different names all throughout history as she is introducing herself to people and while she's on the hunt. But a vampire cannot give a name to themselves that is not an anagram of their original name. Which is to say, if they come up with a fake name, that fake name has to be using all of the same letters as their original name. So she goes by Mirkala, Milarka, and I believe one other over the course of the book. And these, this, is, this is a little bit of mythology that Stoker chose not to use, uh, and in fact, um, so Dracula, Dracula never gives uh, a, another name that is an anagram of his own name. But interestingly, later creators who would use the character of Dracula went back to this bit of Carmilla mythology and chose to only use anagrams of Dracula's name when he was hiding in the open. And obviously the most famous one of these is Alucard, which for most of you watching this are going to recognize that name uh, either having coming from uh, uh, Dracula's character in Van Helsing, who goes by Alucard, uh, or I'm sorry, Helsing, the, uh, the anime Helsing, goes by the name Alucard, or obviously Castlevania, the son of Dracula goes by the name Alucard. Um, so that has been become that has become a mainstay of the genre, uh, it, popping up at different points over the last hundred years or so. But it's not something that Stoker used, and that comes from Carmilla. Additionally, Carmilla has fangs. Maybe not specifically fangs as we are used to seeing them, like in The Lost Boys, but she is described as having needle-like teeth that she uses to puncture the breast of her victim in order to drain their blood. And 
that is something that we do see in Dracula. Stoker seemed to like that and gave Dracula fangs, or at least as he put it, pointed eye teeth. Um, but prior to Carmilla, as far as my research goes, there is no mention of fangs for vampires or specific teeth that are used by the vampire to drink blood, at least not in literature anyway. So Stoker uses, when he goes to write Dracula, he uses the pointed teeth, but he doesn't use the anagram name rule. So do we actually know if Bram Stoker read Carmilla before he wrote Dracula? Because it was some 20 years before Stoker published Dracula that Carmilla came out. If those were the only two things to go by, eh, pointed teeth, you know, you can make a case for, uh, you know, parallel evolution in that particular case, or just sort of zeitgeisty uh, landing on that trait. But as it turns out, Stoker did actually read Carmilla and was obviously inspired by it for a couple of reasons. First of all, the teeth. Um, second of all, the locale of Transylvania for Dracula was sort of a later addition to that book. In an earlier version when Stoker was working on Dracula, he actually set his book in Styria, which is the same place in Austria where Carmilla took place. It wasn't until he read about Transylvania and was inspired to then change the location of his book that he did so. But thirdly, in the short story Dracula's Guest, uh, the protagonist comes across a uh, comes across a a sort of a ruined village in uh, in the wilderness and is attacked by a female vampire that bears some resemblance to Carmilla. And uh, this, this short story was originally part of the, uh, a, a, an earlier version of the manuscript for Dracula when Jonathan Harker had a much longer trip to get to Dracula's castle. And in that original travels, uh, Harker came across this very Carmilla-esque vampirus who tried to attack him. So based on, based on sort of those uh, similarities, we, we can definitely tell that Stoker read Carmilla. And there were a number of uh, authors at the time who did. And uh, Carmilla was a, a fairly popular story. I hate to interrupt younger me here, but since having recorded this, I have learned that uh, when Bram Stoker was younger and was a theater critic, uh, writing uh, uh, theatrical reviews, they were being published in a newspaper that was owned by Sheridan Le Fanu. So Bram Stoker actually technically worked for Sheridan Le Fanu when, in, in his salad days. Uh, now, whether or not the two of them ever you know, were sitting in high back chairs in some lounge someplace discussing, uh, you know, Carmilla while sipping brandy. I, I, I don't know that, and, and I'm not sure that, that any of us do. But, uh, but that is certainly another connection there, that, uh, that if Bram Stoker knew Sheridan Le Fanu, then there's a, a much better chance that he would have read Carmilla just because then that was something that they could discuss. So there's evidently a very good chance of that having happened. Uh, back to younger me. But what inspired Lefanu to write Carmilla? Uh, certainly uh, he may have been inspired by the, uh, the stories that came before. Um, Varney the Vampire and Polidori's Vampire, certainly. But um, there are a couple of much more direct references that probably inspired him. Uh, the first of which is a poem called Christabel by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, 
which is considered to be uh, a very early uh, a very early published work about a vampire attack in the English language. Now the word vampire is never used in that poem. However, the character of Christabel seems an awful lot like the character of Laura, and the character of Geraldine seems an awful lot like Carmilla. In fact, if you read Christabel, and it's a very short read, it's, it's just sort of a, a long poem, it almost seems like just a, just like a poetic version of Carmilla. Uh, so that was definitely an inspiration for Lefanu. Um, another inspiration, uh, which some of you have probably already put two and two together here, was the character of the Countess Elizabeth of Bathory. And we will be doing a Vampires Before Dracula on her as well. But she is not a literary creation, she's actually a historical figure who, who lived. And in fact, she may or may not have had some actual family ties to Vlad the Impaler, even though she lived a hundred years after he did. However, uh, Elizabeth Bathory, regardless of her connections to the historical Vlad Tepish, was herself a member of the Hungarian aristocracy who was a serial killer who killed young women. In fact, we don't even know how many she killed. And she, she killed them in some pretty horrific ways to the point where when she was finally discovered and arrested, the grounds of her castle were mushy with all of the dead decaying bodies that had been buried there. She and her cohorts ran out of room on the castle grounds to bury all their victims. So that was definitely, uh, if not a literary inspiration, was a historical inspiration that probably influenced Lefanu to write this story. But there's also a slightly lesser known story that, uh, that likely inspired him a little bit. And this is one called The Mysterious Guest. We don't know who wrote this story. Okay, normally I wouldn't interrupt my younger self here, but 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 in this particular case, uh, not only have I told you the wrong name of this book, it, it's not the mysterious guest. It's actually the mysterious stranger, uh, and and I I love this book because it is it predates both Carmilla and Dracula and and has a lot of the elements in it that we later associate with Dracula. Um, but as it turns out, I just found this out yesterday. And that is that uh, modern Dracula scholars have discovered who the author is of this book. And it is a guy named Carl von Waxman. And this is hot off the presses for, you know, a book that's 200 years old. Uh, but anyway, back to it. But this will also be one that we talk about on Vampires Before Dracula. In it, there, the vampire is a knight named Azo, the knight Azo. And he lairs in a castle in Styria. And that's from before Carmilla's time. So right there, we have a connection that makes it so that back during Lefanu's time, vampires would have been associated, based on the mysterious guest, with Styria, or at least in Lefanu's mind. That seemed like sort of the mysterious, sort of dark, wooded, mountainous locale that was perfect for vampires to be hiding away in. That was also a place where uh, that was a place where clearly Bram Stoker was thinking, oh, this is the place where vampires should be hidden away in. Um, so that also likely had some influence over Lefanu in writing Carmilla. Now, Carmilla may not be commonly known to most people, the way that Dracula is a household name, but among vampire enthusiasts, <clears throat> she's a big deal. 
and she she comes up a lot and she's a very popular character and there have been numerous film adaptations of her book uh the most notable of which uh is um the hammer films movie the vampire lovers which is pretty much a direct adaptation of Lefanu's book, and actually pretty faithful as well. Hammer Films was uh, making lots and lots of different movies uh, back in the 50s and 60s. Um, but they, they, had really, they had really exploded with their Dracula movies. And those were extremely popular. They played all over the world. They made Hammer lots of money. And, but they needed another vampire sort of another vampire storyline to to create movies for. And so Carmilla seemed like an obvious choice. And probably the most famous uh, actress to play Carmilla was Ingrid Pitt, who played Carmilla in the Hammer film. And uh, so whenever you like do a, you know, a Google search for Carmilla, usually the pictures of Ingrid Pitt are the first thing that come up. Um, and she, so she was a, a very, a very famous uh, scream queen because of that film. But Hammer then went on to do two other movies in what is referred to as their Karnstein uh, trilogy. Ingrid Pitt was in neither of them. Carmilla, the character herself, was only in the second one that came out, and by the third one there were entirely new uh, cast of characters. Uh, Roger Vadim did a, um, a version of Carmilla uh, called Blood and Roses. Um, you've got, uh, there was a version of Carmilla that was made for Showtime that was uh, very interesting in that the fact that it, uh, it cast Meg Tilly as the character of Carmilla and uh, I believe Ione Skye as Laura. And, um, and interestingly enough, they chose to set the story in the antebellum South. And it works. Like, it really works. Like, you, you, they hardly had to change a thing, and you just bought it. I mean, all the characters have American accents, but it works just as well in that time period. So that's a, an interesting take uh, to watch. Um, but for those of you who are perhaps a little younger and haven't seen all those versions of Carmilla, you may be more familiar with the web series Carmilla that came out a couple of years ago. And it, this one is, I, I don't remember how many episodes they did, but it was multiple seasons uh, and this version is more modernized in the fact that you're following Laura's video journals from college and Carmilla becomes her new roommate in her dorm room. For as different as the, the setting and the time period is, the thing that's so nice about this particular project is that this is the first time that the story of Carmilla has been taken away from the... Um, the, the very male gaze focused uh, uh, creators. And so it becomes the celebration of independent gay women falling in love with one another with the, all, all of the things that go hand in hand with, with vampires being thrown into the mix. So only now, 150 years later, is this story being claimed by the people that were written about in the actual novella. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, hopefully uh, someday we'll get a chance to uh, talk with Spencer Maybe and uh, Natasha and Elise um, uh, about the, the whole journey of going through the Carmilla web series, but uh, regardless, it is up on YouTube, and you can absolutely watch that right now for quite a period of time. They did a lot of episodes. And then they did a movie afterward. But apart from uh, straight-up adaptations, Carmilla has also appeared in a number of other projects as a supporting character or as a cameo. She has appeared in Vampire Hunter D, Bloodlust. 
uh, as one of the main villains in that one, and a very interesting portrayal. Uh, and then she also has appeared most recently in the Castlevania Netflix animated series, where she takes on a very, very prominent role. Uh, you know, obviously Dracula is uh, considered the main villain of Castlevania, but uh, he sort of cedes that position to Carmilla by season three. And we spend a lot of time with her and sort of what her plans and goals are and her retinue and fortifications. And the county of Styria becomes an important staging ground for the story and, and her role in it. Um, but it's not just in the Castlevania anime. If uh, those of you who are longtime players of the games, um, whether it's the traditional uh, Konami games or the, uh, the couple of Lords of Shadow games that came out, Carmilla has been in almost all of them. And uh, when it was a sing simple side scroller, she was a uh, uh, she was uh, one of the boss villains who you had to defeat. And in the Lords of Shadow games that came out, she was also a boss villain that you had to defeat, but was a far more of a temptress, uh, seductress type of character who, you know, maybe didn't have that much of a character arc or a whole lot of dimensionality to her character. But herein lies the difference between, I think, the original Carmilla novella and, and adaptations that have come out of it and when she is used as a supporting character in other stuff. And this is a... This has, I think, been a problem with the character of the, the very seductive female vamp uh, in a lot of storylines, and especially media portrayals, is that she comes across as sort of this very, very sexy, voluptuous uh, character physically, who tries to seduce whoever the heterosexual male main protagonist is and then immediately tries to kill him. Those are not a character at all. So, uh, so I think the, uh, the, the Castlevania anime does an excellent job of taking Carmilla and giving her character and giving her goals and giving her a personality and some humor and to go along with wickedness and deviousness. And she's just a much richer, more interesting character. So I guess let us hope that that is now an upward trend of Carmilla's portrayals in the upcoming uh, vampire projects that we see uh, in the future. And perhaps that will be in your vampire project. If so, will she be a villain or will she be a hero? Will she be devious or misunderstood? Will she be the master of a whole coven of vampires or will she be fighting against the master vampire who is the antagonist of the story, using her skill and cunning to win the night? Carmilla Karnstein is in the public domain which means that she is free to use in your vampire project. And if you find yourself in need of a clever and intelligent femme fatale with fangs, then the Countess Carmilla Karnstein makes an excellent choice. Your vampire dollars. In this particular instance, uh, I sort of have two different versions of Carmilla that I would suggest to you, and it just depends on what exactly it is that you want from your Carmilla experience. Uh, if you go with the Vampire Lovers, which is the uh, sort of uh, iconic Hammer version, you're going to get uh, a, a wonderfully rich uh, visual movie out of it, but uh, there is a lot of nudity and uh, a lot of blood thrown around on screen. If that isn't your particular cup of tea, then I recommend 
Carmilla that was done by Showtime as part of a uh, an anthology of horror series that they did uh, called Nightmare Classics. So this particular version of Carmilla, as I stated earlier, uh, stars Meg Tilly uh, as Carmilla and Ione Skye as Laura, and also has Roddy McDowell in it, who you may recall as playing Peter Vincent in the original Fright Night. So that's someone with some vampire pedigree that was, was added in. And this version is, uh, is, is a really great watch, and it dials back the uh, shock value for pageantry, uh, and also includes several um, details of the book that the Hammer version did not ultimately use. So it really just kind of depends on which version it is that you want. Either way, enjoy. So before we go, I just wanted to uh, let you guys know about another YouTube channel that is all about vampires that is called Toothpickings. And this is uh, made and run by a guy named Brian who is absolutely wonderful to watch. He's absolutely enthralling to listen to. And his show is where I learn a ton of this stuff. So like, for example, the having just found out who the real author of The Mysterious Stranger is after 200 years, I learned off of his show yesterday. So like, it, it feels like every time I tune into one of his episodes, I, I, I learn something completely new. Uh, so I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, if you like this show, you will definitely like his show. Uh, so definitely check out Toothpickings and, uh, you know, add that into your vampire YouTube experience. Uh, I, I highly recommend it. Thanks for watching this first episode of Vampires Before Dracula. Uh, we'll be doing a number of these. Uh, we'll be learning all about not only Sir Azo from The Mysterious Stranger, but Lord Ruthven and uh, Countess Bathory and uh, a whole bunch of others uh, who influenced uh, and led up to Dracula. So uh, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.